Well, friends, turn with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 8. We're continuing our study in the Gospel of Mark. And we come this morning to the very end of the chapter, Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. So follow along uh, in your copy of the Scriptures there as I read aloud. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now friends, as I look out of this room, I know that some of you have seen at least as many winters as I have. And you know that sometimes in life you hear some news that changes everything. Some of you have heard news like that. I remember when I was a newlywed uh, in the first year of marriage, I, when I was 21, and my, my wife and I discovered that she was pregnant. That was not what I expected at that time. And everything else about myself and my life suddenly looked a little bit different upon hearing that news. My job looked different. Our housing situation looked different. Our bills looked different. Our relationship with the church, with family, with friends, it all looked different. I was something different all of a sudden. I was going to be a father. I was a father. The implications of that revelation were huge. They were far-reaching in my life. And here in Mark's gospel, what we've witnessed in recent verses here in this passage is that the disciples have gotten some shocking news. They've gotten a revelation that they were not expecting that has effectively changed everything. That news is that the Christ is going to die. Now, if you recall, these, these disciples, these Jews living at this time in the first century, they were expecting the Christ to come. They've been waiting for him to come. They were expecting the deliverer and savior that God had promised. They knew that he would come in time and he would conquer their enemies and would save them as God had promised. They assumed that when he came, that deliverance was going to happen immediately and in a very material and political way, though, they were expecting revolution. They were expecting a new kingdom to be founded there and to push out the kingdoms of the world. They did not imagine that God had a far greater sort of deliverance and a far greater sort of conquering in mind. Deliverance that was ultimate, that was spiritual, and that was complete. And that the means of that deliverance was not at all what they were expecting. In fact, it was the very opposite. Rather than conquering and delivering them through killing their foes, that the Christ would conquer through dying himself on the cross as a substitute in their place to atone for their sins. The disciples grew up in the same sort of world that we did. The way of the world being of strength and power and force and influence, they were not expecting the chosen one, the Christ, the Messiah to come and himself to choose the way of the cross the way of suffering, the way of humiliation, the way of sacrifice and submission. So it was quite a revelation in the verses preceding the ones that I just read a moment ago that Jesus begins to teach them that he must suffer many things and be killed. That has implications. What does it look like to follow a Lord like that? 
What does it mean to devote ourselves to him and trust him and go with him when he's not leading a, a revolution, but instead he's walking that path, the path to the cross? What does life look like trusting in a God like that? That's what our text is about today. There are two parts in the text here. We're going to cover them separately this, this morning and then in a few weeks. First is the call itself. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And then following that is some persuasive reasoning to help us receive it. What does it profit to gain the whole world and lose your soul? We'll talk about that in a few weeks. Today, the call itself, though, in verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, a word about the setting here. Jesus had been with his very closest disciples, just the twelve, in the previous verses, revealing to them only at this point that he was was going to die, was going to suffer and be rejected. But now, at the beginning of, of this section, in verse 34, he calls the whole crowd to him, all that were around. Because what he's about to do, the, the call he's about to issue is for everyone. The call to discipleship is open. It is inclusive. Any may come to Jesus and be welcomed. In fact, all may come, but they must all come the same way, the way of the cross. And that's what the call is. He begins by saying, if anyone would come after me. I think it is helpful first to have a sense, to think carefully about what he's actually calling them to. To come after me, he says. He is not saying, if anyone would apply my teachings in their life. If anyone would live by my principles. If anyone would adopt my teaching as a philosophy and framework through which they view themselves. What he's saying is, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would leave their lives, would leave their own agendas, would leave their own plans behind, and come with me instead. That's the call. He's not calling them just to be students who learn from him, but to be disciples who follow him. He's calling them to be followers. Now, in the time that we're living in, followers is not a word that conjures very positive imagery in our time and place. Right? If you had a child in your house and you said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a follower. Yeah. Hmm. Do you? Independence and individuality are so highly valued in our culture. So much so that the category of being a follower in a positive sense, is actually pretty foreign to us. We are accustomed, rather than being followers, to being judges, right? to, to being presented with lots of options and picking and choosing the parts that we like. Everything from the meals that we eat to our insurance plans to our politics to how we parent to our, our friendships and relationships, even our churches, we're accustomed to coming at things like consumers who are evaluating vendors, we're presented with options and we make our decisions. We listen to a little bit of this and a, a little more about this and we configure it how we like and that's how we make up our lives. Our lives are like, in, in one sense, like this great boardroom with me at the head and the chairman's seat and all these seats around the table. And sitting in those seats is you know, my upbringing, my education, my experiences from the past, the opinions of my friends, the expectations of my family. This article that I read on the internet, this book that somebody gave me, this podcast I listened to, this video that I saw on YouTube, my hopes, my dreams, my fears, all of these sitting in these seats around the, the boardroom table and contributing to this grand debate of how am I going to live my life? And I'm sitting there as the judge of all of it. What is my life going to look like? All these counselors are contributing to this Wonderful, fascinating, unique person that is me, myself. That's, the, that's the, the way of thinking that is common in the world right now. 
And because of that, sometimes the call to discipleship that Jesus is making here gets misunderstood pretty profoundly. And we hear it as something less than what it really is. Sometimes we can hear this call, come after me, as effectively Jesus saying, let me be part of that conversation. Give me a seat around the table. Make sure there's a chair for me in the boardroom. Give me a voice as one of your counselors. You know, make my word and my church a part of your life, a big part of your life. Make it part of what guides you. But that is not what Jesus is calling them to here in the text, is it? Jesus is not saying, if anyone would be influenced by my teaching or by my example, he's saying, if anyone would come after me, if they would leave what they're doing and come with me, they must choose me instead of all others. You think back into that, that boardroom in your soul. Jesus is not saying, let me have a seat here among the other board members. What he's saying is, in one sense, you need to abolish this board entirely. You need to kick all of these other board members out. They should not be here. In fact, I should be the only voice at the table. You need to make my word, my will, the only factor that governs your life now if you come after me. The call to come after him is a call to follow him and him alone. That call is inclusive. It is open to all. But the life to which we are called is very much exclusive. It is to leave all else behind and to go with him. And friends, that, that is a radical call in a time like ours. To say there is no room for hedging of bets. There is no balance here. There is no moderation here. There is no risk management involved. You must be all in. You, come with me, he says. That's, that's bold. And it, and it goes even deeper than that. Because look what follows. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Let her deny herself. If you're going to come with me, here's the first thing you've got to do. Deny yourself. To deny. You know what denying is. To, to reject something, to refuse it, to renounce it, to abandon it, to forsake it. You know, his application was denied. In this case, what must be denied? Himself. Herself. The call to discipleship is becoming even more radical. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Jesus is clear here. This is not a call to just do without something or even many things in life. This is not a call to asceticism and denying the pleasures and the promises of the world. Nor is this a call to the denial of, of just a certain sort of lifestyle, you know, rejecting and renouncing certain behaviors in favor of other behaviors. Now, what he's calling us to is to deny our very selves, to reject ourselves, to abandon and forsake ourselves. That's a wild thing to say, isn't it? So much so that people sometimes say that it's nonsense. How can someone deny themselves? No. Friends, I'm going to pause here. You'll have to forgive me. Something was wrong with the heat last night. The heat was on in this room. It's very hot. I wore short sleeves today, so you'll have to see my tattoos. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but I'm going to start pouring with sweat here. <laughs> As I was saying, it's a wild thing that Jesus is calling them to, to say, how can someone follow me if they don't deny themselves? It is a call, effectively, to denounce self as the dominant element in life in favor of following Jesus. It is a call to replace self with Christ as the chief object of affections and source of authority. 
You go back to that, that boardroom image in your mind one more time. When all the counselors were there around the table, I was sitting at the head of the table making judgments ultimately. I was the chairman of the board. And when Jesus comes in, it's not even that he's content just to say, you must get rid of these board members and have me be the only one. You must abolish the board and let me be your sole counsel and guide. It's, it's actually more than that. What he's saying is, you have got to get up out of that chair at the head of the board table and let me sit there. Because that's not your seat, that's mine. He's saying effectively, I am going to be the chairman. I am going to be the judge. I am not a counselor. I am your Lord. If you'll come after me, you must deny yourself. To hear that call and to respond to it, on some level, it really is to let go of my own identity in a way and to be redefined by my connection to him. To deny self, to deny myself, is to have his will replace my will, to have his will become law in my universe. The, the kind of like, like gravity is a law, like it's just the reality, it's just the way that it is. So the will of Christ is just the way that it is in the universe that I live in. And friends, in a world like ours, where the affirmation of self is the greatest good for so many, and the rejection of someone's self-determined identity is the greatest form of violence that can be done to them. This is radical, what Jesus is calling them to. This is extreme. This is dangerous. Let him deny himself. It's not just in our day that it was extreme, though. It was in theirs. So the very next part of his call makes that clear. Let him deny himself and take up his cross. You all are familiar with the cross. A cross is a symbol of the church and Christianity and a symbol of Christ. And you, you know very well that in the first century it was a symbol of death. A symbol of something horrific, something violent, something disturbing even. The cross was used by the Romans for executions for the, the despised and the lower class criminals. Insurrectionists would be you know, stripped down naked and nailed to a post and then let dangle in the sun until they were dead. It was a slow, painful, humiliating sort of death. And at the time, in the first century, when Jesus was saying these words, on some level, the cross would have been the most visible sign of Rome's oppression, of the shame and dehumanization involved in it. You know, there were these huge uprisings that were put down and that resulted in mass public crucifixions where you could walk on the road for miles with crosses on both sides of it. It was a symbol of Roman power and oppression. And in that way, it was the perfect symbol of what these folks surely thought the Christ had come to destroy the oppression of his people. Right? He'd come to free them from all of this, from that sort of suffering and humiliation and slavery. The Christ was coming to oppose the cross and what it represented. To get rid of the cross would have been their thought. But instead, Jesus tells the crowds here, if they would follow him, they must embrace the cross. They must choose the cross. He doesn't even say, come to terms with the fact that it might happen, so be ready. He says, go ahead and take it up now. It's a call to martyrdom, to a, a willing death. And as part of this call to discipleship, it does signify two things to us. So the one is the totality of this call, the commitment of it. To come after him involves a willingness to give up absolutely anything and everything for the sake of Jesus. I mean, you imagine somebody in that first century who had literally taken up the cross in their own execution. What else matters to them at that point? You know, what they owe to the debt collector? Their plans for vacation that year? The rent? Did any of that matter to them? Nothing mattered once the cross was taken up. 
But the second thing that it signifies is the presence of suffering and discipleship to Jesus. The very fact that Jesus would frame it this way, that he would use this illustration, of all illustrations, the cross. I mean, some branding, right? Some advertising. Some of you here are in sales and marketing and public relations. This is not the slogan, be all you can be, live your best life now, you can have it all. The slogan is, go ahead and die. Slowly, painfully, in humiliation, die. You know, all the church growth consultants in the world cringe at that and would pull Jesus aside privately and rebuke him, right? Hold on, hold on. You don't know what you're saying. Right? Didn't that happen in the previous passage? But Jesus knows what he's saying. He's chosen his words very well. Those who choose to follow him are choosing, in one sense, to submit to suffering and to do it willingly because his way is the way of the cross. It is a way familiar with suffering. And so to come after him requires a willingness to suffer. In fact, even to choose it and not shrink back from it. Friends, how do you think the crowds in the first century understood this call? You must take up your cross. I mean, in the years following his ascension, when the disciples and their followers after them, the early church, preached this message across the whole area, they got the reputation for being a suicide cult. Did you know that? They were thought of as crazy people because of the call to deny yourself and take up the cross. You know, try that the next time somebody asks you about your religious views. I, am, I have devoted myself to a first century Near Eastern suicide cult. <laughs> see, see how that looks on the application, right? But friends, we know the context here, don't we? Jesus wasn't commanding his people to do something evil. This is not Jim Jones, right? Not the Jim Jones who was an elder here. The other Jim Jones, right? <laughs> He's not telling them to go run off a cliff like lemmings. He's calling them to follow him. Right? That's what's next. That's how this began. Come after me. And that's how it ends. And follow me. That's the call here, really. It's not just to listen to him. It's not even just to do what he says. It is to come be with him as he walks the path. Jesus, we know, is in the process of denying himself and taking up his cross, literally. I'll read to you those verses in Philippians just because I don't like to miss an opportunity to read them. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the path that he's walking, and the call to discipleship is the call to join him, to leave everything else and to go with him. For those present in his hearing that day, it was likely understood First, as a literal call, and with a prim primarily physical response, you know, leave your nets, leave your homes, come with me, follow me, which is in itself a demanding invitation, but as extreme as a call as that was, it was actually even more demanding than they realized because it was a call to do so spiritually, ultimately, to put all trust in him, to obey him, to honor him above all else. Today, the gospel call is sometimes thought of as only spiritual, as if that were somehow less than physical, literal, immediate. Though, because the spiritual is the heart and the foundation, and the physical, the, the material, all follows after it. To answer the call to be a Christian, to follow Jesus, 
is to deny yourself, to take up your cross, and to follow him. And friends, Christians in every generation have had to count the cost of following Jesus. For many in the day that Mark wrote these words, that Jesus spoke them, it was literal martyrdom. And that was the case for many over the years. The cross, the stake, the noose, the the prison cell, the concentration camp. But for many, many others, it has looked like suffering and sacrifice in other forms throughout life. And that's the case even today. And we've been praying recently in our prayer meeting some for our brothers and sisters in Japan where there are so few Christians there, such a small portion of the population is trusting in Christ. And the overwhelming majority of them in so many churches are all women, 80, 90% women, which means to follow Christ potentially is to say, "I I will not find a husband. I will not be married. I will not have children. There are parts of the Middle East where allegiance to Jesus Christ is the same thing as total destruction of reputation and social standing. And there is no possibility of lucrative career and financial stability after the commitment is made. Here in the U.S., we've been shielded from much of that, but that's changing rapidly. And increasingly, we're living in a time where to be allied with Christ, to follow after him, is to ensure that we'll not get commendation or respect from the world. That shame and derision will follow. In fact, you might even be labeled as toxic. And there's more of that on the way. Already, you can't work all the hours that your coworkers are willing to work and still be faithful to your church and family commitments. And so following Christ does have a career cost, a financial cost. Already the, the pool of eligible spouses and friends and relationships is smaller if you're going to follow Christ. Now some of, some of you all, some of the young people in this church, you're going to go to college soon or into the workforce, and you're going to discover there is a social cost. Right? There are cute girls, there are cute boys who are interested in you. But if you're going to follow Christ, that is a relationship that is not available to you. There is a cost there. right? And it's not just young people. Friends, we're living in a time where The children might grow up in our household and then looking back decide that we were indeed toxic as parents. That we were in fact devotees to a first century suicide cult. And that might cost us in our relationships with our kids, with our grandkids. It might be very costly if we decide to follow Jesus. But that is the call here in the text, though, isn't it? It's not a call to your best life now. It is a call to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And friends, here is a foundational element of Christianity that is essential, yet often ignored, the cost of discipleship. To follow Jesus is not to have his help in building my own empire, It is to abandon my empire and give myself to serving in the building of his. Too often in our time, Christian discipleship is understood as a means of building my empire still, of making my life more like I want it to look. I mean, you just have to drive down the street and see church advertising to see this. You want to be connected in the social community? Well, Come here, we can fix that. You want your, your family life to be better? Well, come here, we can fix that. You need, you need financial peace in your life? Come here. Emotional health? Come here. You want a good life? Well, come here, get it at the church. Is that what Jesus is saying in this passage? I'll be the avenue to you having everything you ever wanted? That is not what he's saying. He's saying if you would come after me, You must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. That will involve suffering that is the way of the cross. Now why is it that way? 
There are many reasons for that. But most simply, it is that way because that is the way that he himself walked. And the call is to go with him. The call is to leave everything else for him. So friends, the question I want to ask you this morning, have you understood the call to discipleship through that lens? The call to follow Jesus and trust in him, not as a promise of of him delivering to you what you have always wanted, but rather a call to give up everything for his sake. There are many who attend churches and hear preaching from pulpits like this one and continue in nominal Christianity, paying lip service to Jesus, but never really hearing this call and responding to it. This is the call he issues, though. The call from his lips is not one to be healthy and happy now or to have your best life now. It is a call to self-denial, to become familiar with suffering, to lose things in order to be with him on the road that he walked. This is what trusting him looks like. It must be what believing in him looks like. To trust that the path that he walks is the right one, no matter what it looks like now, because he is on it. And that being with him, the one who would give his very life for me, even if it costs me everything in this life, it is worth it, because that's where he is. Let's let's pray together now. Our Father in heaven, we read your word and we desire to understand and we desire to obey. Uh, But we have fallen very far from life in your presence in Eden. There's a lot to be undone and redone and transformed and renewed in our minds and hearts. And we pray that you would renew us. We pray that we would be gripped by the call to discipleship. We would not despise the cost of it, but we would trust in our Savior. We pray, Lord, that as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together now, that you would help us to reaffirm our faith in him and receive again the provision of his sacrifice. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.